My name is Simani Kostra. Um, I am the Climate Adaptation Finance Advisor at the Climate Change Adaptation Unit at UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. This event has been organized by UNEP in partnership with the government of Eswatini, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and the International Institute for Environment and Development. Unfortunately, our speaker today from the government of Eswatini has been held up, but we shall continue, and if she's able to join us, she will do so. However, we have an excellent lineup of speakers today, um, including from the Commonwealth Secretariat and online. The side event is looking at debt for climate swaps and its use as an innovative financial instrument for public debt management. We heard at the opening ceremony of the Africa Climate Week the importance of managing the debt crisis in Africa and that debt for climate swaps can be used as a potential mechanism to contribute financing for climate action while also providing debt relief. At this side event, we will hear different perspectives and expert opinions on how we can use debt for climate swaps to ease the debt crisis in Africa and redirect financing towards climate action for the continent. We have an excellent lineup of speakers today. We will hear from government ministries of finance and environment on the interest in the use of debt swaps to raise capital in their countries for climate and sustainable development activities. We also have on the panel the Green Climate Fund, the International Monetary Fund, and the African Development Bank who will provide guidance and advise us on ways that debt for climate swaps can be used. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pichenji, the Commonwealth Regional Climate Finance Advisor to Africa, to provide us with some opening remarks. Dr. Vichenji has vast experience in different development contexts and has worked in leadership positions, including at the UN. Over to you. Thank you, Sumali. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, we recognize the presence of the Minister of Environment for Kenya. Welcome, Honorable Minister. Welcome to this afternoon's side event on debt for climate swaps. As introduced, my name is Helen Tichenja from the Commonwealth Secretariat and I'm the Regional Climate Finance Advisor to Africa. On behalf of the United Nations Environment Program, in collaboration with the Kingdom of Eswatini, as well as the International Institute for Environment and Development and the Commonwealth Secretariat, I welcome and thank the distinguished panelists as well as all of you for coming together this afternoon for this discussion on debt for climate swaps. A warm welcome to those of you joining us online. We are here to examine whether debt for climate swaps may help in simultaneously tackling the worrying debt levels as well as the climate concerns in African countries. This event arises from the work of these partners, that is UNEP, IIID, the Commonwealth Secretariat, in supporting the Kingdom of Eswatini in assessing the suitability of incorporating debt for climate swap in an ongoing UNEP-led Green Climate Fund proposal. The GCF proposal focuses on increasing the resilience of vulnerable communities in mountain ecosystems. The Commonwealth Climate Change Program aims to strengthen the resilience of Commonwealth countries to the negative impacts of climate change. Through our flagship initiative called the Commonwealth Climate Finance Africa, we provide technical assistance to a balanced approach of project pipeline development, technical and policy support, and capacity building. This includes engagement for enhanced delivery of climate finance, not only from the public sector, but also from the private sector with the use of innovative instruments such as debt swaps. The debt and climate crisis are escalating in Africa, can be tackled both simultaneously, can be killed two birds with one stone. 
on the debt crisis. More than two years into the COVID pandemic, the debt situation has deteriorated significantly in many African countries. In 2019, before the pandemic, the average debt to GDP ratio for Sub-Saharan Africa was 55.4%. In 2021, after the pandemic, the average debt to DGP ratio for Sub-Saharan Africa increased to 60.3%. The effects of the war in Ukraine are likely to significantly worsen the debt crisis, further undermining debt sustainability. High levels of public debt service and insufficient fiscal and monetary space have impeded much needed investments in climate resilience, posing risks to vulnerable households and communities. On the climate crisis, a number of studies have shown that climate vulnerability is driving up the cost of capital of climate vulnerable developing countries. Nine out of 10 of the most vulnerable countries globally are in Africa. Further, the Africa Adaptation Report by the Global Center on Adaptation shows that in Africa, climate change is locked in for the next 20 years as a risk amplifier. Thus, there is danger that the vulnerable developing countries will enter a vicious cycle in which greater climate vulnerability raises the cost of debt and diminishes the fiscal space for investment in climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to get a deeper understanding on how debt for climate swaps work. We will hear more on this instrument during the panel discussion. But in simple terms, the debt for climate swap is an instrument whereby debtor countries are relieved from their contractual debt obligations in return for local climate-related spending commitments. Some questions to have in mind as we listen to our distinguished panelists are, what has been the experience? How have debt for climate swaps been designed? In what situations is the instrument most suitable? What are the challenges? How can we realize the full potential of debt for climate swaps? Ladies and gentlemen, can we kill two birds with one stone? I'll now welcome Sumali to, from the, to introduce our distinguished panelists and moderate the discussions going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kipenji. May I ask uh, Ms. Santos if she's connected? Yes, I can see you. Our next speaker is Ms. Santos from um, the the Ministry of Finance in Cape Verde. She's the Director General of the Treasury Department. Ms. Santos leads the administration of the state treasury, as well as uh, the banking services provided to the administrative public sector institutions and the management of public debt and state financing. The government of Cape Verde has already taken the first few steps to understand how debt for climate swaps can be leveraged to support government budgets. We will start to hear more about that process from Ms. Santos. Over to you, Ms. Santos. Thank you, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, so, as uh, it was mentioned uh, already, we know that we are facing a lot of crisis that is um, affecting our countries. And uh, in the case of Cape Verde, it's not different. Uh, Cape Verde is a small island development, developing state. Uh, and we are facing, we can say that we are facing a triple crisis because uh, we have the COVID-19, the war, and in the particular case of Cape Verde, we have also um, the shocks associated with the uh, climate issues um, that we are facing now, almost four, five, uh, four years of uh, doubt. 
So uh, this is one of the crises that also affects our uh, financial, um, our public financial, financial in Cape Verde. Uh, we have the same the same uh, shocks with uh, uh, derived from the COVID-19 also the crisis that uh, the COVID-19 brings to all the countries around around the world that affect uh, also affected Caver with the uh, impact in our economic growth and our government revenues uh, in 2020 combined with the increase in the government spending for support the needs in health protection, support the families and the business that lead to an increase in uh, our finance, uh, financing needs and to a recession of around 14.8%. Uh, and uh, all these uh, factors combined with the reduction of the GDP uh, led uh, our public debt to reach uh, 155.6% of GDP in 2020, eliminating our downward uh, trajectory of this ratio uh, that, start, uh, that started in uh, 2017. Uh, as mentioned already also, uh, we were uh, in a good ratio about our uh, public debt uh, comparing with the GDP. The last two years uh, in uh, 2018 and 2019, we were about 125, 20, 24 percent uh, our debt. Uh, was about one one hundred twenty four percent of GDP, so we face a big increase in uh, twenty twenty uh, with the crisis of COVID nineteen, and then this year we have another crisis caused by the war a war in Ukraine uh, that had a very strong impact on. Uh, Fluid price that did the government, our government, to adopt measures to contain price uh, by placing a cap on retail sale price and through compensations to concessionaires. Uh, so, all of these crises uh, affect our uh, debt, our ratios um, about the public debt, and uh, it led to a decrease in our fiscal space since 2020. So uh, we can uh, say that uh, the, the, this crisis uh, indeed affects our uh, country fiscal space and uh, this uh, debt swap uh, climate we think that it could be a good a good instrument to support to help uh, to support our um, our to give us some free up in our uh, budget for investments for new investments because uh, we have all this crisis but we need to continue to invest in our country so uh, we face this uh, debt for climate swap as an instrument that can help us with emphasis on renewable energy, energies, blue and green economy. Uh, we approach this process by linking the debt swap with climate related key performance indicators in which the uh, these key performance indicators are by, based on national commitments on climate issues, such our NDCs that are in line with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. So, in the case of Cape Verde, uh, 
we think that a good way that we can explore this uh, instrument and this initiative, uh, it's uh, making a mechanism that would allow CAVER to use up to 100% of the amount due as a budget support for renewable energies, blue and green economy related sectors. Um, in addition, we guess that we can set uh, key performance indicators that could be defined that uh, will be monitored and verified by a third party to track specific progress toward a grid uh, sustainable performance target. So we guess that um, practical way that we can, uh, if we can say it like this, to use this instrument uh, to give us some free fiscal space to invest could be uh, making this uh, arrangement uh, that can we can use the amount that we have uh, from another um, debts that we already have to pay. We can use this space. Uh, as a budget support uh, and then use this amount as a space to invest in these uh, areas, uh, renewable energies, blue and green economy, that it's uh, new sectors that it's uh, important to develop uh, our country and we guess that uh, this uh, instrument can help uh, make these investments and we can make it by changing uh, our uh, debit service, uh, our debit serv service um, using this space for make these these investments. Uh, we know also that uh, we have another approach about this instrument that is like creating a fund but we guess that um, using converting this amount uh, to a free fiscal space for invest in the renewable energies, uh, it could be a good approach for us and for our re reality uh, by now. Just uh, to give a brief overview, overview about uh, the public debt of Cape Verde. As I said, uh, our debt, we have uh, external debt and internal debt. Our external, external debt um, is uh, composed by bilater bilateral, um, multilateral and commercial debt. Okay, and our multilateral uh, debt it represents almost 50.6% uh, of our uh, portfolio. So uh, we guess that uh, the external debt uh, converting our or some space in our external debt could be uh, a good way to help us with uh, some free, uh, sp uh, fiscal space for uh, new investments. That's why you think, we think that this uh, instrument could be uh, the swap with uh, climate would be a good instrument to help us facing this crisis uh, that we have now and uh, to continue to invest and uh, make some new things uh, in our uh, public service. So oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Santos, for this excellent insights. We now have uh, Ms. Martina, Massina, uh, Ms. Dudu Massina from um, Eswatini. She is the Director of Meteorology in Eswatini at the Ministry of Tourism and Environmental Affairs. Ms. Massina also serves as the country's NDC Partnership Technical Focal Point and leads the team responsible for coordinating climate action in the country, including the international climate negotiations. 
Ms. Messina will be providing us with some perspectives on the country's interest in the use of innovative financial institutions, I'm sorry, instruments to attract public finance for climate, nature, and development. Welcome to this side event. I'm glad you could make it. Um, thank you very much. Um, such appreciation of this debate. Um, and talking on the subject of uh, debt swap, for which I am no specialist, and I am equally in a very in a space where I want to learn, and the government of the Swatini is also curious. Um, we are a government where um, we are living with a population where um, close to 60 percent is um, living um, below the poverty line, that is of 2017 statistics. And um, if you look at what has been happening recently with the COVID-19 pandemic, where a lot of businesses were lost, there was a lot of uh, job losses, and, um, and a loss of, uh, of, 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 of livelihoods has also killed or affected this poverty line could be um, increasing um, um, in, in recent years. And also 27% of the land is degraded. This also has an impact on the livelihoods of the people and, um, and the capacity to deal with, um, with, 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 uh, with climate change issues also. And um, the whole country is infested with uh, alien invasive species, um, also affecting livelihoods. Um, and most of you are people who um, are into livestock and farming. And if you are having um, such invasions by alien invasive species, which are also um, some of which could be also a result of climate change, then it, it, it's really impacting on the country's economy. Um, the Southern Africa region is also having uh, uh, an energy crisis, uh, particularly on uh, electricity. And um, SYP is importing most of its um, electricity, um, about 70% from South, from South Africa, which is coal fired. And um, we have an agreement that ends soon. And with this crisis, we don't know where we are going. And this is also affecting our future um, outlook um, with regards to um, capacity to for the economy to continue increasing and also um, challenging our, um, our, our, our efforts to, to, to get to net zero, which is a global effort. Um, we have also been impacted by a lot of things. I've already said something about um, the COVID pandemic, but we have seen um, um, cyclone Evolves, which hit us as not before we had uh, recovered fully from the 2015-2016 from the droughts, and we are still battling to recover from that. And while we are, we are getting a lot of other severe um, events, um, which which is also in flash planting, affecting infrastructure. Um, this past summer, we had um, a, a, a lot of rain and there was a lot of infrastructural damage and so on. Now, having said all of this, we find ourselves also having to have a commitment um, under the climate um, agreement. We have an NDC. We are still developing the implementation plan, uh, which is going to assist us uh, better cost it. But the initial indication shows that we need about 950 million to 1.5 billion million billion US dollars. Um, just to get to 14 percent um, below uh, business as usual, we would like to um, better increase our ambition going forward. We would like um, to be able to collect more information that would inform us better to do that. But how do we do this um, when we um, when we are um, a country that is developing with a lot of challenges which other developing countries are having? Um, recently, um, um, our 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 that the GDP ratio rose from about from below 20% to about 40%. And part of this um, was as a result of the challenges that we're facing with, um, the, with the COVID pandemic. Um, so um, it, it's, it's really challenging how do we can um, partner with um, local um, 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 funding to mobilize um, 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 the external funding that could be made. So for us, the question is, um, why shouldn't we explore any innovative um, 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 financing that is there? Can't we look into this one as one of those? And um, I have said that the debt for this one thing has increased to about 40%, but I was just thinking some African countries are even about 100%. I saw one who will not mention names that are even about 100%. So the question is, 
why can't we explore this and make it work for us? Particularly because um, as I am here um, during this week, there's been a lot of talk also about those countries that are more vulnerable also having lower capacity to um, to access the mainstream um, climate finance. We have had cases where just accessing even a readiness program under the GCF will take you even up to 3% of back and three years of back and forth and trying to get the financing. So while we are accessing, we are doing our best to build capacity and access that, can we be innovative? How can this do for us? And saying that we still need a lot of information. We have central ministries that are also, um, we are telling them that this, this instrument, they are asking us a lot of questions. We are trying to answer some, but we are, as our people from the environment um, sector, climate change, we are not fully capacitated to talk to the finance issues. So we do need um, more information out there to help us. We do need more um, 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 information sharing. Um, we have already started on that. We have had um, some sessions where we are sharing information and, and we are inviting the central ministers. But there is more. Just next week, we are scheduling a breakfast meeting with them to deliver it on this more. But more information, um, more clarity, um, more lessons learned. And it's a new instrument, but we are willing to explore it. We need innovative financing. We need to meet our commitments. But um, the economic outlook is not looking very good for us. But if we can use that, it's um, yeah. it helps us. And I think it would be useful for uh, most African countries if it's possible. It also um, cuts down on the need to have um, finances um, to pay um, in, in, in foreign currency, yet here you could be using local currency, but it, again, it depends on what the understanding is and how it's utilized. We are willing to learn and we want to know more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Messina. Uh, this is some excellent insights um, from Iswatini. In fact, uh, the insights that we've received from both Kate Verde and Iswatini very much represent the vast majority of say of African countries that are at the very early stage of looking at how debt for climate swap mechanisms can be used for debt relief and climate action in, in the countries. Um, we will now hear a little bit of a different opinion from a country that has already signed and is in the process of implementation of the debt for nature swap. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Jeremy. She's the CEO of the Seychelles Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust. Previously, Ms. Jeremy was the Director General of the Biodiversity Conservation and Management Division, Ministry of Environment, Energy and Climate Change from the Government of Seychelles. The Seychelles uh, actually signed a very unique Nature for Swap deal back in 2015. Um, and in that deal, almost 22 million US dollars of its national debt was, was written off. And that was in exchange for the country implementing a set of actions to protect its oceans. So we will now hear from Ms. Jeremy on some experiences from that deal. Over to you, Ms. Jeremy. I think I did see you online earlier. They're fantastic they were. Over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much, and uh, and thank you for um, welcoming me welcoming me into the into the event today. I think it's such a it's always such an honor for us to actually get to share a little bit of our experiences and and also try our bit to help other countries that are thinking about you know how to. So the, the do's and don'ts and the best and the lessons learned, I, I suppose, relating to depth for nature swap. So, of course, thank you for the for the very um, helpful introduction. Takes away from um, some of the things that I would have had to um, mention. So, as you rightly said, so the Seychelles, we we started our depth for for nature swap back in 2000. Actually, it was quite a lengthy process. So we started back in 2009. Um, and this had been mostly due to the economic crises that we that the world encountered back in 2008. And this is the time that the government started to, you know, to ponder about the possibility of restoring some of its debt, which at the time stood at over 150% of our GDP. 
with an external public debt that represented about 95% um, of our GDP. So as you know, Seychelles, we are a very, very small country. We've got 150 tiny islands and we are 99% ocean and tourism and fishing are major parts of our economy. So as a result, our people and economy, we are quite vulnerable to the threats of climate change. And already, even at that time back then, we had already started to um, encounter more severe storms and rising sea levels. And we had started to see um, warm ocean temperatures and diminishing fish stocks and all of that, which linked a lot with our vulnerabilities to the climate change phenomenon. And so therefore, there was a lot of, of thinking about, you know, how to improve our, our situation. And uh, for us, we were fortunate enough to um, to start a partnership at the time. The government of Seychelles um, started this discussion with the Nature Conservancy um, based in, in the States. And through their Nature Vest arm, this is where we started to um, to work on our um, on our debt. So the, the social step conversion itself, it's, <coughs> sorry. So the, the TNC um, was, allowed, was able to raise a mixture of grants and repayable loans um, for a new non-profit trust. So in essence, the conservation trust, the conservation finance trust that I currently head is a direct product of our debt for nature swap. It was created for us to channel the proceeds of the debt swap and also to fulfill some of the terms and conditions that were agreed to um, at the time. So the SECAT, the trust that I work for, it uses the debt payments from the government to one, repay the initial capital that was raised and two, to fund ongoing conservation program. So in exchange for restructuring our debt obligation on more favorable terms, the government committed to improve policy and increase investment in conservation, so creating marine protected areas. So one of the key commitments that the government of Seychelles made and that was tightly linked with our debt for nature swap was our 30 percent marine protected marine protection areas. Um, which the president announced back in 2012. And our commitment was that we would go from a 0.1% coverage of our total EZ, which is a total of 1.34 million square kilometers, up to 30% protection by the year 2020. So that was one of the caveats and also at the same time, when we were looking at the debt furniture swap, that's when we also was able to start working on our marine spatial plan and to use that as a tool that would work very closely with our debt furniture swap. So now I'm just going to focus a little bit more on the so the structure of the of the debt itself. So after lengthy negotiations, like I mentioned, we were able to um discount 20.2 million dollars at a rate of 93.5 cents on the dollar of some of the debt so we had a total of 80 million that we had originally wanted to restructure but through the negotiations we had some pull out from some of the partners and eventually we were only able to um to restructure a proportion of that so, but the transaction was still quite notable for several reasons. One, because it was the first time that the Paris Club creditors, which was the biggest group um, um, that we, we, we could buy back our debt for, and it was the first time that this had been designed to benefit the environment. And the creditor participation in the agreement was the highest ever achieved in a buyback that was reached through the Paris Club's market-based window. Um, so the final step, in the restructuring process was for us to raise the 20.2 million to purchase the sovereign debt. And this is where the Nature Conservancy was quite instrumental. So the Nature Vest was able to raise funds from two main sources. So first, they were able to raise $5 million in grants. And that was raised primarily from philanthropic foundations that included the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation, Waits Foundation, Oaks Foundation, amongst others, 
And then the second, whereby TNC was able to provide a $15.2 million loan repayable at a 3% um, rate over 20 years. So this was um, mostly what the what the structure of the of the debt was. So the structuring process itself. So we had to identify and work with the debtors, um, the debtor country to purchase the sovereign debt, and we were able to secure the commitments from the debtors to improve policy and increase investment in the specific area. And secondly, we were able to identify and reach proper agreement that would allow us to sell the debt owned by the debt to countries. We were able to fundraise for repayable loan and non-repayable grants, capital for debt buyback. And we were also able to establish a local trust fund, the Seychelles Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust, to lend debt to country funds to purchase the sovereign debt, receive the debt payments, and fund the programming. So um, in essence, we were able to now get the full five million grants, the full five million dollars that we were going to disburse over a number of years through conservation and climate adaptation programs. So this is one of the key milestones of the of the debt for nature swap in that it has been able to to put a, available in the country. Um, over $200,000 every year from the from the debt for nature swap proceeds enters the SACAT and it goes towards the funding of small to medium sized projects within the country of up to 2 million rupees to local NGOs to local actors for them to undertake projects that speaks to marine conservation, marine protection, the development of the blue economy and as well as sustainable fishing. So since 2015, the, the depth for nature swap was finalized. And in 2016, SACAD became fully operational. And as of 2017, we have started and we have run six full cycles of what we call the Blue Grants Fund here in Seychelles. We have funded over 56 projects which is equivalent to over $2.5 million. And we are continuing. We are now in our sixth cycle. And this has been one of the biggest, biggest achievements that we have um, seen. However, it has not all been rosy. There has been quite a steep curve in terms of the funding and how to channel it, how to administer such grants and to make the funds more available to the everyday person who actually wants to undertake the effective programs on the ground, whilst at the same time remaining accountable um, to the donors as well as to the parties. We also have an endowment fund, which we're building it, which will mature in 20 years from the time of the start. And this is something that is ongoing. And then obviously there is the loan component that SACAT as part of its role has to ensure that the government of Seychelles honors. Um, and the fact that we were able to actually fulfill our commitments to protect the 30% of our EZ by 2020, we have also been able to get additional support. And at this moment, Seychelles is um, putting or is considering maybe having a second debt furniture swap. I think I'll leave it here and I will be very, very um, welcome to your questions um, in the panel discussions that will follow. I thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for that, Ms. Jeremy, and I anticipate that we will have a few questions for you um, once we have all the speakers um, speak. Mr. Andre Chichirin, who is the Head of Innovation Technology Transfer and Co-Funding Platforms of the Private Flexibility of the GCF Bank Fund, will now will now uh, provide us with some comments. Uh, what I do want to say is that I'm very grateful to you, Andre, to, to be here today. It's well past midnight in, in Seoul. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Chichirin joined the GCF in, in 2017. Um, prior to that, he had worked for around 18 years as an investment and finance professional with regional authorities, private companies, and international organizations. And this was across um, Eastern Europe, Asia, and Africa. Today, Mr. Chair will provide some guidance on how a debt for climate swap instrument can be used to restructure debt with support from the GCF. 
and this is going to be very interesting for, for several of us today. Over to you, Andre. You're, you're on, still on mute. Apologies. Thank you very much, Somali, for your kind introduction, and uh, thank you very much for uh, offering me this opportunity and present uh, that for climate as well approach as we see it in the context of activities of the Green Climate Fund. Now I'm sharing my screen with a small slide and schematic representation of a potential implementation strategy that we have as a mechanism to implement that for climate swap uh, with participation of the Green Climate Fund. The cornerstone of this uh, implementation strategy is a coordinated effort among three key stakeholders, developing country debtor, a creditor country or several countries, uh, primarily from uh, developed countries constituency, and of course, Green Climate Fund, the largest financial institution dedicated to uh, financing and support mitigation and adaptation climate projects in developing countries. So the key uh, underlying mechanism of this uh, debt for climate swap deal is a free party assignment arrangement that on one hand captures uh, appropriate terms and conditions of uh, this uh, mechanism and on the other hand outlines uh, rights and obligations of each party involved in the process. To successfully address uh, issues uh, that are supposed to be uh, implemented or uh, uh, utilizing climate debt for climate swap as a solution, definitely a first a step and initial effort we expect him to receive from developing country which is the most interested in that uh, mechanism. And the first effort on that uh, way is to design robust uh, climate related uh, mitigation or adaptation project or program that would uh, be supported by financial resources received from the debt for climate swap. For that, uh, GCF runs several readiness programs we are supporting country programming and of course uh, looking forward to potential opportunities in cooperation with interested parties to facilitate preparation of these projects in order to uh, find uh, uh, find uh, debt for climate swap implementation. Second uh, step is uh, engaging creditor countries or countries with a proposal to uh, take part in this debt for climate swap deal. As we uh, indicate here, uh, the creditor countries who are agreeing to support this mechanism will contribute uh, their creditor rights. Uh, and here we're talking about bilateral creditors so far. This is the easiest way to implement uh, that for climate swap mechanism in our context. So they will contribute creditor rights uh, to the Green Climate Fund mechanism. Reciprocally, we will receive funding proposal from the developing country which will be linked in its implementation as a condition precedent to this contribution and effectuation of uh, next steps in that process. After receiving this uh, 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 creditor rights, uh, debt for cl uh, Green Climate Fund will, <clears throat> in coordination with developing country, will uh, either uh, convert this into the local currency of uh, developing country debtor and ultimately contribute this local currency to the uh, projects uh, or uh, in some cases may also contribute this uh, funding in the, in the hard currency of initial indebtedness. So as a result, uh, we will receive uh, financial support for the ongoing projects in developing country. We will receive a total uh, uh, decrease uh, or um, uh, diminishment of the debt burden and ultimately support a uh, much needed uh, climate mitigation and adaptation project uh, with this mechanism. So this is schematic representation and definitely as many speakers uh, told uh, before, 
we see some challenging uh, ways uh, and some challenges in, on our way to implement this. Particularly, definitely, uh, first step for us to see is a robust uh, climate-related mitigation and adaptation projects that will be supported. This is a coordinated effort between uh, different uh, stakeholders and constituencies within the government, of course, uh, maybe uh, spearheaded by the national designated authority. Another key challenging moment is engaging a uh, greater country cooperation. And as we heard from Seychelles experience, it is not straightforward, however, with a goodwill and clear view of uh, where the money monetary contribution will go what will be implementation uh, mechanism to ensure that results are achieved uh, that uh, <clears throat> we get the funding to the purpose where it is intended this is where gcf can bring the most value in that scenario by providing its uh, robust uh, measurement reporting verification system dedicated divisions uh, that are monitoring and evaluating performance from different angles, including independent uh, divisions uh, that are not uh, constrained by the uh, organizational structure of the Green Climate Fund. And some other safeguards that we have in place in order to ensure that the process of the debt for climate swap is effective, uh, transparent, and uh, ultimately reaching its goals uh, in all all dimensions that they're talking about, not only uh, climate related action support, but also in terms of debt relief, which is achieved by uh, this implementation. So uh, final uh, remarks is that this uh, implementation scenario is a, a straightforward and plain vanilla option that we can definitely adjust depending on the conditions existing in a particular situation of uh, specific developing country and of course it's uh, negotiations with creators and other uh, conditions that might be relevant for structuring or adjusting this uh, scenario to to become uh, operational and ultimately effective uh, i'll stop here and definitely will be happy to take your questions and answer them thank you very much thank you very much uh, andre we move on to our next speaker now, who is Mr. Vimal Thakur, a senior economist from the IMF, um, sitting within the Strategy, Policy and Review Department. Um, Mr. Thakur previously worked in the Fiscal Affairs Department, covering expenditure policy issues, and with the South Africa, Eswatini, and Turkey teams. He is the incoming resident advisor on macroeconomics and climate at IMF's Africa Training Institution. Today, Mr. Thakur will be highlighting a few points on the analysis, design, and implementation for uh, on debt for climate swaps. Over to you, Wilma. Thank you. Thank you, Samani, and uh, pleasure to be here. So, as you already mentioned, I'm going to talk about a recently issued paper on uh, how we see debt for climate swaps uh, and uh, its usefulness as an addition to the climate finance toolkit. First of all, what is the novelty of the debt for climate swaps? In a sense, we are trying to address a debt problem and a climate problem. If we are looking only at a climate problem, then we can think of uh, providing climate conditional grants, or we can think of conditional lending of the type of ESG instruments to finance those. If we are thinking of a debt problem, we usually think of fiscal consolidation or debt restructuring. What a debt for climate swap does, in a sense, is it combines both. And it provides us with partial forgiveness and conditionality. The issue is that might not be enough to restore debt sustainability or provide the level of climate finance that is needed for countries to meet their NDCs. As we have seen, all the debt for climate swaps, debt for nature swaps have been around for the best part of three decades now. The total amount of debt that has been treated remains quite small, 4 billion or less. And that includes 200 transactions. So if we are thinking about uh, enhancing the impact of debt for climate swaps, we need to think about how to scale it up. But before we get there, a question that we ask is, how do we do that? In a sense, 
is debt for climate swaps the best instrument? And the way to think about it is it depends on the country's situation. If a country does not face a debt problem, then climate conditional grants are better. They are better because they are conditioned on the country implementing specific policies, and there is no risk that these policies will not be implemented because of the conditionality associated with the disbursement. On the other hand, with debt for climate swaps, we can find ourselves in a situation whereby the country reneges on the promise and then the monitoring costs kick in. But if a country is facing a debt problem, then we need to think about debt restructuring. And uh, debt for climate swaps under those circumstances may not be adequate to restore debt sustainability. That's it. We, when our approach is more pragmatic, in that in today's world, given elevated debt vulnerabilities, reduced fiscal space, there is a space for debt for climate swaps in the broader climate finance toolkit. And this has to do with uh, the fact that uh, in many countries, grants are not forthcoming necessarily, and debt relief is not necessarily on the table either. And if you have the opportunity to do a debt for climate swaps under those circumstances, then of course, if it is the only instrument available, please go for it. But if uh, a country is in uh, debt distress, and debt for climate swap is seen as debt restructuring light, it might still provide some space, but it might not be adequate to restore debt sustainability. So our bottom line is, it very much depends on what is the objective the country wants to address. And the design of the debt for climate swaps will be crucial in determining whether we restore debt sustainability. That's it. Given the overall financing needs and elevated debt vulnerabilities, debt for climate swaps can be a useful addition to the climate finance toolkit. I would use the remaining few minutes that I have to just touch on how do we maximize the impact of debt for climate swaps? Basically try to get as much debt under treatment as possible, bring in the private creditors, bring in the official creditors. And if the pool is too restricted, Think about uh, engaging third party buybacks to increase the pool that, of debt that is treated. Also try to get the debt buyback at a high discount. Maximizing the discount reduces, of course, the debt burden. And buying back the debt on a secondary market is, when it is already being discounted can be the best way to do that. As our colleague from Seychelles mentioned, having a collective action close might be useful to ensure that there are no holdouts. Now, when you're buying back the debt, of course, you're raising money. Then to think about uh, how you can use the ESG instruments and maximize the premium that is associated with those financing to reduce the cost at which you are taking the new loan. And uh, of course, IFI involvement for guarantees and the likes can be helpful to reduce the cost of the transaction. So with that, uh, I will stop here now and happy to touch on uh, some of the other aspects related to scaling up debt for climate swaps uh, during the discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know I do have one question for you after this. Um, our last speaker is Dr. Innocent Ona. He's the Chief Natural Resources Officer at the African Natural Resource Management and Investment, Investment Center at the African uh, development Bank. He leads work that falls across the public policy, governance of natural resources, climate change, and green growth areas of the banks. Dr. Ona will be explaining the role that the AFDB can play in supporting countries developing a debt for, for climate and nature swap. Over to you. Thank you very much, and good evening. Um, so today's conversation has been very interesting, uh, particularly from the development bank who uh, has operations across Africa. So um, it's very important for us to have this kind of conversations. One, because the topic on our discussion, even though it's very old, um, 
it has only very little applications across board. And uh, what we've noticed, um, if you want to consider the burden of death, of death stress on so many African countries vis-a-vis -vis the volume and amount of transactions or the volume and amount of debt swaps that have occurred within the last 20 years, uh, you will see that Africa still has a long way to go in terms of, first of all, understanding the, understanding the mechanisms and methodology and also um, applying them. So what the bank, what the, what the African Development Bank is doing, first of all, is to take a deep dive, you know, try to understand how this thing has worked. I mean, we've had, listen to speakers from Seychelles this morning from Eswatini and Cape Verde, particularly Seychelles. I mean, where they've already, already um, uh, re recorded more than up to 56 projects. Is this kind of success stories that we decided to take a deep dive to really understand how African countries with, the, with huge debt stress can benefit from it. So for example, we are currently finalizing a study on uh, the feasibility of the feasibility and policy significance of uh, debt for climate and nature swaps as a sustainable financing tool. Uh, the study provides detailed policy recommendations uh, regarding sustainable financing options with a particular focus on debt for climate and nature swaps, how transactions can be designed, learning from countries like Seychelles, for example, um, how can the, 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 the bank develop its own debt action plan to be able to specifically speak and design interventions that could help to relieve some of the death stress that African countries are, are currently going through. Um, the, 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 the study will potentially place the bank in a situation where we can provide debt management advisory uh, by assessing the viability of debt and the range of economic and environmental factors that could inform the design of this debt. Uh, expected outcome from this study, for example, is to develop uh, a debt restructuring framework uh, of course, using uh, IMF guidelines, you know, to perhaps reclassify some of, you know, the countries within Africa that are really, really in debt, and then see how, you know, we can categorize them either as extreme, high risk, or um, high risk of debt distress, uh, maybe some color-coded red or yellow light countries, and to some extent, fragile countries. I mean, those that do not have a headroom for uh, non-concessional debt across um, uh, key economic variables. So while carrying out this evidence-based policy advisory, we are also delving into how we can learn from these kind of studies and events like this to develop technical assistance and capacity buildings for our regional member countries. And most importantly, uh, a key role that the bank can play is to play a facilitating role uh, where we can identify opportunities for countries, either as a lead arranger or credit enhancer how we can connect debt swap participants, such as original creditors, new creditors, debt, the debtor governments, and conservation organizations, and local conservation projects. So we are uniquely placed to be able to connect all of these key stakeholders together. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, operations across the 55 African countries. So by understanding and study uh, 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 studying how debt for climate and nature swaps have occurred over the years in countries like also Madagascar, uh, we will be able to, at some point, perhaps also serve as a donor institution where we could consider bilateral debt forgiveness uh, or be a part of multi-party debt swap, uh, swap uh, donor or also consider sustainability-linked bonds uh, where we can actually see what aspect of our ADF financing can go into it. But before all of this can happen, uh, we need to, first of all, make sure that uh, it is based on evidence. We need to ensure that the economic indicators are favorable for those African countries that we, have, we, we would push forward. And we need to also ensure that the environmental factors are right. Uh, how would this help to protect key biodiversity areas, for example, using uh, IUCN classification? How would it lead to improving uh, the ecosystem situation of these countries. Do they have the natural assets that can also become like uh, financial capital when discussing debt for nature swaps? So some of these key questions are, are yet, we, the bank is still understanding it. Uh, so we are really happy to 
be here um, and we hope that um, by the end of this final discussion and during the Q&A, we can share more lights on how collaboration can start from this kind of discussion and uh, we, we thank the uh, Africa Climate Week and the organizers for this event. Thank you and over. Thank you very much, Innocent. With that, uh, we've had uh, our views from, from the last people and we have about 10 minutes now for a Q&A session. I would like to invite uh, both, you know, those participants online and those in the room today to raise your hand and ask um, ask people any questions that you might have. Please. Thank you so very much. Uh... Uh, the organizers for this absolutely. May I request you also just to identify yourself? Oh, sorry, my, my name is Kenya Kutubiko. I am the cabinet secretary uh, environment and forestry in the Republic of Kenya. Uh, so a couple of issues, really. It's a very interesting uh, discussion. I'm just wondering. Uh, besides uh, seashells, that has one um, sucks. I don't know that we can really call it a success, a success, maybe a success story potentially. Any other in the world? We will see that that's very experimental. Uh, uh, this the statements. Um, and then two, do, do, do we have um, internationally established settled guidelines and, and good standards. Um, and and, and that at least now in terms of the legal aspects. What is the in the event of non-compliance uh, on the conditions and the commitments? What happens? Uh, in that situation, then the, the, the debts can then be. Uh, what happens in that situation if the country, the beneficiary country, fails, is unable really to perform the commitments that have been? Thank you. Three excellent questions. May I invite the, the speakers to raise their hands um, if they would like to provide a response. Who would like to go first? And Paul, uh, please do. And I welcome you to also um, come and join us at, at the panel. Uh, Paul Steele from the IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development, will be providing us with some closing comments afterwards. But he has been working on their thoughts um, over the past couple of years. Before we go to the meeting, I will give you answers. I would just like to get um, one more question that is there. So as well, I'm, I'm trying to remember who among the speakers talked about um, that part, um, working on us depending on national circumstances. So my question is, is there a rough um, particularly um, I talked about um, that, 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 that get to GDP percent or is there a rough um, uh, that you could think about to say probably these are the features that would um or the privacies that would I don't know that I said that would make it uh, that that have a that there are potential for working for a certain country. Thank you very much. So I think that, that last question is directed um, primarily at you, you remember, in terms of um, and perhaps innocent as well. Um, in terms of how do you qualify a country for a debt for climate swaps? What are the conditions, maybe the top two or three conditions that a country needs, needs to look at? And then we had um, three questions earlier. One that looked at um, the guidelines. Are there any uh, guidelines available for countries to follow in the development and the design of a debt? that nature of debt for time and swap. Um, we also um, had a question on accountability. Um, you know, is there any defaults on the agreements of the deal? What are the accountability 
guidelines as well. And the very first question um, seashells, was seashells. regarding the, the seashells. And um, I think quite an open question about perhaps some views on has it been a success? Um, what are the lessons learned so far? I think, uh, Ms. Jeremy, you, you mentioned some of those. Uh, were there any pitfalls? Um, how is the debt deal um, uh, considered and looked at globally? Is it uh, something that we should be duplicating, replicating with a few other considerations uh, based on um, the fact that you know you're one of the first countries to to do this? Um, so, pan uh, panelists, please do raise your hands and uh, contribute. We have a few other questions, but um, I think let's let's first answer these four before we take any others. Ms. Jeremy, please do go ahead. OK, um, thank you. It's very encouraging to to hear the questions, I guess, um, and, and all the interest that you have around um, our process. So I guess I'll start with the last the last question first. So focusing a little bit on the um, so the, the local perception around the debt for nature swap, um, as you know, this is quite a technical, um, it's quite a technical venture a dealing and for, for people locally, it actually did take quite a bit of time for people to understand and appreciate um, what the government was doing and why government actually would engage um, in such a, a restructuring deal. But I think um, as and when the SECAT actually became operational, and they started understanding how the proceeds were working and where the resources were being made more available to, um, to the public. I think this is um, when people started to appreciate it because I remember back in the first call, I believe we got very little, like 13 projects and were able to only approve seven projects in that, in that particular call. But in this call that we had this year, we had over 56 applications um, total applications and then of course based on the number of resources that we have then we um, uh, we identify a number of projects that we can support um, but I think it, it actually takes time and your accountability measures that you actually put in place to support the activities that you intend to do at the outset and how you report on that is actually what builds the confidence around the process and again in terms of lessons learned um, a lot of the things that we actually put in the in the agreement with TNC between government and TNC, um, they had to be updated and changed over time because the learning curve was quite steep. It was the first time that the country had done such a venture. And so therefore there needs to be some flexibility around how the deal is done and also to have proper review mechanisms within the agreement over the lifespan of the contract so that you are able to, to fix it as you know, as and when things change. Um, and this is something that we have had to do. And just this year, we have had to review the Establishment Act of the Trust because there were some limitations on the ground and in the implementation that we couldn't have foreseen at the time when we set up the trust. So um, that is something that you have to, to be mindful of. And, uh, and in terms of having guidelines to support debt for nature swap, you know, um, Seychelles has documented its own process quite extensively, and we are still working on our debt swap and MSP story, which we hope to to be publishing quite um, quite soon before we start full implementation of our MSP. And a lot of it will be around lessons learned and potential for upscaling, which I think would become quite um, important for other small island developing states that might be considering such a venture, but even to other African countries, African coastal states that might have similar models to Seychelles, looking at exploring blue economy concept, you know, um, innovative blended finance, which is the heart and, and soul of what we do at SECAT. So um, I believe there the, there is um, scope for that. And uh, just to, to think of another place where they've actually done another, another massive deal um, is Belize. And theirs is a lot, a lot, a lot bigger than ours. And I think there's space there to also learn because it's also TNC that has brokered this, bill, um, this deal. And, and it's also TNC that worked with us here in the Seychelles. So TNC would have likely a wealth of knowledge that could be shared um, quite extensively to other African countries if there is appetite. 
I think I'll, I'll stop there. And I think I've touched on quite a few of the questions through, through these answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jeremy. Lindley, would you like to go next, please? Thanks, Simone. And uh, just uh, a couple of comments uh, from my side. So when is a debt for climate feasible? In a sense, it depends when there is an alignment between a debtor country and a creditor country. Absent this alignment between the two countries, you can think of a trilateral debt, debt swap whereby you bring in a third party who buys back the debt and then allows for the debt swap to go through. So that is like one of the first conditions uh, when you can think about uh, proceeding with the debt for climate swaps. Now, the other point is um, the objective of those the debt for climate swap. What is the objective with which it is being done and the context within which it is being done? Particularly the context matters. If debt for climate swap is being undertaken as a way to circumvent an unsustainable debt situation, the risk is we might not be able to restore debt sustainability and we are just pushing the problem further down the road. So that is something that uh, is important. Now, if it, the objective is to provide climate finance, of course, debt for climate swap is a useful addition to the toolkit. It should definitely be scaled up. And uh, at the same time, other instruments, including ESG instruments, grants, uh, financing from philanthropic organizations and everything else should be leveraged because debt for climate swaps on their own will not provide the amount of financing that countries need uh, to meet their NDCs. There was another um, question linked to the accountability, very important question. In fact, uh, this is one of the reasons why debt for climate swaps have remained small in nature because the pro they are project specific by and large. And because of the specific nature of the projects, the transaction costs are huge, the monitoring costs are huge, and a creditor country might not go ahead with a debt for climate swap if it is unsure as to whether the debtor country will implement what it promises to. So it is a bit of a chicken and egg story. And uh, there is a fantastic work that has been done by Paul and Sejal Patel on uh, how a programmatic approach to debt for climate swaps can circumvent some of these problems, including having good public financial management and everything else. So the other way to think about it is uh, to finance projects that are less reverse, less prone to reverse, reversal. If you do a policy reform, there's a risk of reversal. If you do a project, the risk of reversal is smaller or zero in most cases. So this is uh, something that can be brought in to address the commitment and accountability problem. And finally, the other thing is uh, in the design of debt for climate swaps, we can think of penalties, although people don't necessarily like penalties. So we can think of sweeteners. For instance, if the country meets its obligations, then there can be a subsidy that is given on the cost of the debt, which reduces the overall cost of the debt. So we have to be creative in terms of how we think about the accountability mechanisms and enhance those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bimal. Andre, would you like to, to go next? Thank you. I just can uh, uh, second what was just said by uh, Mr. Takor on the key elements of interest alignment, accountability mechanisms and uh, overall approaches uh, that would answer some of the questions that were raised. We're all uh, answering maybe a broader context uh, question uh, why we do not have this uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the international finance as uh, some of the tools which is widely approached and applied with guidelines, with standardized, standardized forms. It's definitely uh, driven by the circumstances 20 years ago uh, Green Climate Fund did not exist. Uh, Climate-related uh, problems were sort of a uh, not mainstream issue that is uh, now shared by everybody. 
and definitely community, world community was much more fragmented, whereas now we are uh, sharing uh, this discussion, uh, sitting on different parts of the world almost, almost seamlessly. And we're also recognizing how close we are in terms of our shared destiny uh, facing all these challenges that changing climate brings to the humanity. Therefore, combining all these circumstances may be opening up uh, new opportunities for the approaches like that for climate swap, like uh, effective cooperations between uh, debtors and creditors, not uh, just for sake of money, but for sake of future generations of uh, humankind. It's a, it's a new chapter in our a shared uh, life here on this planet. And this is where we try to find this solution. Not definitely a bullet, a silver bullet that would solve all the problems uh, in one shot, but definitely something that can effectively supplement all the efforts that are done by great people from different countries, different continents to achieve our shared goal. Again, uh, we do not have uh, Earth number two, and this is clearly understood by everybody who is now sitting in the hot Africa, who is now flooded in Pakistan, or facing uh, air pollution in uh, dense, uh, densely populated areas in Southeast Asia. So all these things are now in place. Uh, maybe critical mass is created, and we're converting this into action, step by step, moving towards our goals opening up these opportunities, running test pilots, uh, combining uh, important statistics and establishing learning curves to achieve uh, maximum efficiency for future projects when we can have guidelines, we can have standardized forms, when we can ex expedite the process uh, to the maximum uh, possible uh, speed. So this, these are the key thoughts, maybe uh, capturing all this contextual but important matters that I would like to put into the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. We have time for perhaps two more questions. Uh, we're running uh, a little a little over. I would like to invite um, Kevin Bender and Chloe Farrand, if I got your name correct, uh, to please um, unmute yourselves and ask the question or type it in the, in the chat box. Uh, sure, and thanks. Perhaps, sorry, sorry, and perhaps Sam, um, no, I think Sam, Sam typed his uh, question in the chat and I think he received an answer from ASPB. Um, Kevin, do go ahead. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so I'm, uh, I work at the Nature Conservancy and I was actually the transaction lead on the Belize transaction, but was not around during the Seychelles. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, there's, we could have a five more hours of discussion here, but you know, I just want to highlight that the the bilateral, one of the problems that we had, as was mentioned on the Seychelles deal, is that yeah. the bilateral discount we got from the Paris Club was small, right? It wasn't a, a, a large discount. And that's why we shifted to, or we didn't shift, but that's why we started exploring the commercial sector, right? So when when uh, there was a you know six and a half percent discount on the bilateral debt to the Paris Club, when we started talking to Belize, because they were in a debt problem um, and they had negotiators sitting around the table and, and, and the, the capital markets were already talking to them, their bonds were trading at 38 cents on the dollar, right? And we ended up getting pretty close to 50 cents on the dollar. So that was half of you know the money that we we and we we structured out $190 million, which is really about $250 million of their debt. And Belize was small. So that really moved the debt to GDP ratio pretty, pretty significantly. We don't have that opportunity, but so what? What I would like to th see is a focus on both of those solutions, right? So, and when I see, I don't really see it's the IMF's role to encourage these, but I know it helps with the debt sustainability. And I think one way to do it, like, is the IMF considering, you know, including and highlighting these climate risks in their debt sustainability analysis, right? And even their Article 4s and showing that, all right, this is a big thing. There is a real play here with solving climate, re reducing climate risk uh, and increasing, you know, debt sustainability and therefore even, even improving their rating, uh, credit rating and borrowing lower in the capital markets. Um, that would be a great thing for us to get, you know, go to more bilaterals and argue the, a, a deeper discount on 
uh, on these bilateral negotiations. And then on the commercial side, it's really GCF and African Development Bank. You know, we need to scale these things. Uh, we we got the credit enhancement from the uh, the, the uh, Development Finance Corporation in the United States, but you know we could do guarantees, we could do all kinds of uh, uh, credit enhancement, but we we are limited by our credit enhancement, right? If we're going to pull money out of uh, out of if we're going to pull debt out of the capital markets on the private side, we 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 need the credit enhancement, right? We need to redo, we need to offer them a better solution to what they're paying now, and that requires credit enhancement. So. Like, is there a specific tool that you guys can offer that could help us do more of these? Because quite frankly, I think with with the debt sustainability problems that we're seeing in Africa, everybody's trading at a discount, which means people in countries aren't even going to the capital markets because new debt is so expensive that we need cheaper solutions and therefore we need credit enhancement to come in. And what we did in the real big win, I think, in the Belize transaction was that we went from CAA3 rated Belize borrowers and then finance them with AA2 rated, you know, um, uh, borrowers, right? Lenders. Um, sorry, not borrowers, lenders. And that is a gigantic market and that's, you know, much larger and it was a real success shifting from one to the other. And now those were both Moody's ratings. So it was a 16 step, uh, step up. Sorry, I've taken a lot of time, but I'm just worried. I'm just trying to think about how to scale these things and scale them quickly because the debt sustainability problem is high. And the climate risk is not going away. Thank you, Kevin. I think that that question was directed more to you than me. But before um, you answer, I'd like to ask Chloe to, to please go ahead and ask her question. And Sam, I think you actually do have a question, so I, I will let you have a go as well. Chloe, please go ahead. We can't hear you. Sam, would you like to go first? Um, whilst, uh, yes, please. Uh, I, I can go. I can go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, my question goes to the to Andrew uh, GCF. Uh, are you considering um, other uh, multilateral institution uh, as part of the creditors that you will be dealing with? Because from your presentation you have uh, only creditors uh, countries. So uh, what about multilateral institution? Because some of the African countries are also indebted to multilateral institution, development banks and uh, financial institutions. So uh, are you considering that in your, in, your, in your portfolio that besides bilateral, which are crediting uh, uh, countries, you also uh, absorb others? from uh, uh, you know, other in financial institutions that these countries are indebted to. Thank you. Over. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very Indeed. much, Sam. This is, this is a very relevant question. On the one hand, we cannot exclude that instead of uh, create a country, there can be multilateral uh, financial institution to participate in this deal. At this point in time, uh, we have a clear straightforward indication that our contributors, uh, countries, uh, sovereign countries, therefore, uh, that particular implementation that was presented in my slide might not be straightforwardly realized uh, in the current state of uh, GCF uh, capital base formation uh, approaches that we have in place. However, it does not uh, exclude a situation where we can uh, provide funding or co-funding and again as it was mentioned credit enhancement very valid approach where GCF uh, leverages maximum its concessionality it, because as financial institution we are not interested in the financial results of our operation per se we are more focused on the climate results uh, mitigation and adaptation outcomes of our projects so considering something that would be implemented as a debt swap on the project level where GCF uh, plays a side role, but nevertheless actively participate, including uh, providing credit enhancement, including um, uh, providing co-financing and ensuring that other creators and uh, stakeholders' interests are aligned, we cannot uh, exclude that situation and definitely would be uh, flexible enough to find appropriate structure uh, to accommodate uh, participation of multilateral financial organizations in that deal. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Andre. 
Uh, the last question is for you as well, Devon. Um, it's from Chloe Farian, a reporter at Climate for News. I'll just read it out for everyone. Um, our question is, will the IMF board and management endorse your working paper? Do you think there is appetite for this in the organization? The IMF was expected to present a debt swap mechanism at the COP26, which did not happen. And can we expect an announcement by the IMF on debt swaps at COP27? Um, over to you, Lemon. Yep, thanks. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, this is a, a working paper which reflects staff's views and uh, has not been uh, endorsed uh, by our board. So when it comes to debt for climate swaps, as I mentioned before, um, it is a decision that is between the debtor and the creditor. And uh, to the extent that such transactions happen and they help improve the debt sustainability position of a country, then of course it is a step in the right direction. On COP27, I will have to revert back. We are currently finalizing our work program on that and uh, I will revert back on that one. Now, there was another question from uh, Kevin on uh, the IMF and the DSAs. Indeed, uh, we are working on uh, integrating climate change modules into our debt sustainability framework for market access countries. This will have a long time, longer term horizon, up to 20 years, and look at uh, adaptation mitigation um, in uh, expenditures associated with those and also look at the impact on growth. And uh, within that, of course, uh, to the extent there are scenarios to be run with uh, debt uh, discounts or debt swaps, these can be integrated uh, within the DSAs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bimal. And I'd like to thank all the speakers for your time and insights today. To close the session, I would like to now hand over to, to Paul Steele, over to uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to make three quick comments because we've had uh, a fascinating discussion and uh, as someone said, we could have gone on for five hours. But um, the first point is, um, I think we're reaching a positive tipping point. We're seeing growing demand from debtor countries, both in Africa and in other countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and Asia as the debt crisis grows. And we're also seeing growing support from creditors and financiers. We have here on the panel, as you see, the IMF, the African Development Bank and the GCF, and many others are also showing interest. Secondly, the challenge is upscaling. As we know, debt for climate and nature swaps have been around for about 30 years, but um, they've been relatively small scale. As Vimal said, they've only uh, managed to write off about $4 billion so far. However, our calculations done in a recent report uh, by my colleague, Sejo Patel, estimated that about $100 billion worth of uh, climate and nature spending could be uh, financed through these kind of swaps, even if only 10% of the funds are spent on climate and nature and the rest is spent on fiscal space. So the challenge is how do we upscale? And I think there are three ways of doing that, as we've heard both from the Cape Verde presentation from Sueli and also from Vin Mal from the IMF. Uh, the first one is a comprehensive approach to creditors that's involving, as Kevin was saying, both the private sector, but also all the bilateral creditors, including China, which is an important creditor in many African countries. Secondly, uh, channeling the funds through government budgets with appropriate fiduciary safeguards. While the approach of an independent trust fund, as in Seychelles, uh, is an important uh, first step, uh, it does have quite high transaction costs to set up. So we have been uh, uh, proposing using the government budget. However, to make sure that there is the kind of accountability that many of the speakers have referred to, we need to link it to key performance indicators for climate and nature, which are drawn from NDCs and national biodiversity strategies and action plans, as uh, Sueli and others were explaining. So it's not just about projects, 
but it's about indicators and outcomes. And finally, I hope we can all pick up uh, Chloe's point about having some kind of initiative at COP27, the African COP, so it would be great if the African countries represented in Gabon push for this, along with the Egyptian presidency, having some kind of international initiative on climate and nature debt swaps, taking forward uh, uh, all this important work. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Paul. And I'd like to say a big thank you for the time and attention of the audience today, both uh, those attending in person 